Get ready! You're tuned in to Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T, bringing you the hottest trending topics on social media. Stay connected. Instagram.com slash Lovely Tea 2002. Hey, you guys. Welcome to another episode of Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely T. Yay! Hey, Tea Sippers. <laughs> welcome to another show. And I have my boy Ronan with me. Hey, what's going on? So it is almost the end of 2020. Like we literally have less than 48 hours left of 2020. I, along with everyone, am so ready for it to be over. I really am. How about you? Who you telling? Uh, yeah, this 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 was a very uh, ratty ass year. I'll say. Yeah, I mean, so much went on this year from, of course, you know, the virus hitting and I, you know, did the videos when it first was in Wuhan. But never yeah. did I think that when the virus hit China and was expected to come here, that it would just cause a huge domino effect of what went on this year. This year was unprecedented. I could have never thought about the year, you know, happening in the manner that it did when I was a child. Yeah, Uh we, I mean, we were had these visions of what 2020 would look like, and it's nothing like we expected. I mean, we had to deal with this uh, virus. We had to deal with a whole lot of losses, um, some that hit home. I mean, just just about everything we thought could go wrong, damn near did. Yeah, I'm just ready for a new year. Person. Yeah, everything from the virus to when everything shut down, I think that was just crazy. You know, it's one thing – for us to be wary of this virus, but when, you know, Wall Street shut down and the stock market and, you know, corporations and then regular people's jobs and then mom and pop shops, it was insane. And then to see when everything was going on in New York and it was death after death and, you know, vans to come and collect the dead bodies. It was crazy how much death went on this year. Yeah, Um and plus, you know, just people trying to adjust to uh, things that they thought were certain. Uh, now people are like, I mean, it's, it's good to see that, you know, you have things as far as like learning uh, courses online, which are a lot cheaper than going to certain schools. But just the fact that some people weren't ready for certain changes, they were, you know, and we're, we're, pre we're creatures of habit. So as much as we want to see, you know, people do a lot better, it's like we have to be really prepared uh, for these wild changes out because I don't think we're finished. I no. And that's the one thing I keep trying to reiterate to everybody. Everybody's like, oh my God, I'm so ready for 2021 to be here. New year, new me. And it's like, yes. no, <laughs> what's going to happen in 2021 is that they're going to use everything from 2020. I feel like 2020 was like one huge experiment. And yeah. they're going to use all of that to basically mm -hmm. enforce and bring in all types of new rules, regulations, and they're going to make things so uncomfortable that eventually you're going to run to go take that vaccine. That is their plan. I agree with that. It, it just seems like it's a whole uh, death by a thousand cuts to where like, look, you know, just to get this off me, like, all right, fine. But why would you uh, submit yourself to something that hasn't really been properly tested Um We've heard quite a few things about it, not good. And, you know, just waiting to just literally threaten your life in your way of life in order to be a guinea pig, more or less. Yeah, but the unfortunate thing, it's not necessarily people are, you know, trying to volunteer for this. I mean, you have a lot of people in the medical establishment and in the military who are forced to take this vaccine. I yeah. mean, it's starting with them first before the general public. You know, and that's the part that's scary is never in the history of viruses has there ever been a forced vaccination. Now, granted, when yeah. kids start school, yes, you have to get the, you know, the MMR shots, you know, mm -hmm. um, tuberculosis, things like that. <clears throat> but the point is, a lot of that stuff has been tested for the past 60 years. So for the yeah. most part, they're safe. This is something new and it's unprecedented. And the fact that they're forcing people to take this and the part that's even more unnerving is the fact that now it's come out that there's a, a mutated virus. There's a mutated version of the um, COVID-19. And so this mutated version is even stronger. It's even more, you know, you can cross transmit it even easier. And now they found the strain yesterday in Colorado. So the first American case has been found in a man in Colorado. 
Patient zero. Yeah. That's what comes to mind. And yeah. what makes me scared is, okay, well, then what is the point of the vaccine? If there's now a mutated case, is that vaccine going to be able to protect that? They claim there's a 50, 50 percent chance. To me, that sounds like a bunch of horse shit. It does. Uh, and plus, you can't uh, sue for any uh, damages or deaths from it. So that is not, not only not only reassuring, but it lets you know, like something. Ulterior, I mean, there's a total ulterior motive that's at stake here. And it's like far darker than we think. Yeah, I just feel like. Like I said earlier, 2020 has just been one huge experiment. Everything from mm -hmm. the virus coming in. So that's one thing we're dealing with the pandemic. Like every movie that we've ever seen, right, growing up, you know, end of the world. Those were always yeah. one of the five things like the world may end by, you know, a huge earthquake and fire. Um, yeah. The world may end by, you know, a, a cold freeze where the whole world just turns cold like the day after yeah. tomorrow. Um, yeah. Then pandemics how many movies have we had about pandemics and viruses it's like everything that hollywood has has yeah. thrown at us since we were children literally came to pass in 2020 uh, as crazy it is it makes me want to look at the simpsons again because they've been making some wild predictions and i haven't watched them in years but like i'm kind of nervous in doing it because <laughs> of what i might see yeah so. their predictive programming has definitely been on point and I think the sad part with all of this as well is the uptick in violence that we're seeing. Yes. And the uptick yeah. in violence is going on in every major city. Um, the other day I had interviewed a woman on my podcast, BL, and she was talking about, you know, the violence in Philly because I had been hearing a lot of stuff from mm -hmm. people who subscribed to me from Philadelphia. And I didn't know I had that many Philadelphia tea sippers, but I was always hearing stuff from them, like on the Discord or just, you know, in comment mm -hmm. sections. And then to find out that they're number two in the nation in homicides and, you know, and it was even more people in the comment section of that podcast saying that not only Philly, you know, in Miami, in Charleston, South Carolina, in Virginia. I mean, this is a, a national issue where homicides and senselessness have gone up all around the country. There's a really hot case that's going on right now in Atlanta and J.D. is very upset about the census killing there was a seven-year-old yeah. girl who was shot recently, and um, JD is basically calling for an, um, you know, he's he's doing a call to action, and some people are kind of upset with him. So for y'all who don't know, a seven-year-old girl, she was in the car with her aunt, and they were driving past Phipps Plaza, and a shootout ensued, and she was shot and killed. So I'm going to go ahead and play the news clip really quick so everybody can hear it. And then we'll come back and finish talking about it. We have a tragic update after a seven year old girl was shot while riding in the car with her family near Flips Plaza. Kennedy Maxey died yesterday, and that's according to the Fulton County Medical Examiner. Since the shooting on Monday, the community has just rallied around Maxey and her family. A GoFundMe page raised nearly $47,000. Today, hundreds of people shared their condolences on social media, many calling her death a senseless tragedy. Police say they do not believe the car Maxie was riding in was the intended shooting target. Maxie's death is part of an uptick of violence across Atlanta this year. Just this weekend, Atlanta police responded to three homicides. Mara Siriani has an update. Metro police have worked 155 homicides so far this year. The latest victim is an innocent child. After spending five days in the hospital fighting for her life, police say seven-year-old Kennedy Maxie died the day after Christmas, the victim of senseless gun violence. Police say Kennedy was riding in the car with her mother and aunt last Monday near Phipps Plaza when she was shot in the back of the head. Investigators believe Kennedy was hit with a stray bullet, possibly fired during an argument between a group of men in the nearby Saks parking lot. Atlanta police are still working to track down the shooter. And on Christmas morning, more violence. Around 5 a.m., officers responded to a park in Atlanta's Summerhill neighborhood where they found a man who had been stabbed to death. No word on a potential suspect. Around six and a half hours later, officers were called to southwest Atlanta where a man had been shot at a home along Byrear Terrace. He later died at the scene. And just after midnight on Saturday, 16-year-old Calicia Williams was found in the lobby of the Hyatt Regency on Peachtree Street, suffering a gunshot wound to the groin. Investigators say Williams and a 16-year-old boy had been fighting in one of the rooms, prompting the gunfire. The boy was taken into custody and charged with felony murder. And with just a few days left in 2020, the city has already seen 56 more murders than at the end of 2019. 
All right. So that was very, very disturbing. Um, the seven year old's name is Kennedy Maxey. And like they were saying, this is the deadliest year um, since the 90s. Same year in the Twin Cities. I mean, even childhood friends of mine, some of their kids have been shot and killed up here in the yeah. Twin Cities. You know, and it's, it's heartbreaking because it's just yeah. like the violence just makes no sense whatsoever. You know, it's random. Just people shooting, people frustrated. So Jermaine Dupree, um, he took to social media and he went off. He was really, really pissed off about the situation. And this mm -hmm. is what he had to say. He said, if you really from the A, it's time for us to come together and stop all this shooting shit at Lennox and at Phipps. The police need to get together. The profiling needs to go to code red. I don't give a fuck about y'all getting mad about me saying this. Little kids is getting little kids getting shot is whack. So that is what he said, and a lot of people were kind of upset. Like, okay, why would you say that the police need to profile people? Because obviously, when they profile people, nine times out of ten, it's gonna be black people. You know that they're yes. profiling. No, I wholeheartedly agree because uh, I was a victim of that, mm -hmm. and just got pulled over from going from Chicago to Fort Wayne. And right outside of Warsaw and four cop cars came by, pulled me over just random. And I'm just wearing my work coveralls and I was standing, you know, right in front of the cop car. And, and I seen him searching my truck because I told I was want to hurry and get out of there. And I seen him pull something out of his, you know, front pocket. And he was looking to plant it when he saw me looking at him and he put it right back up. Now, he could have done anything he wanted, but for someone to go cold red just because of one thing, we're getting profiled enough as is. Multiply that by 10. Because now you're just promoting a green light on basically us in a way. And I get where he's coming from. I mean, this stuff has to stop. But again, you got to really take some time to really think about what you're tweeting out there. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Because that was, personally, I was irresponsible for him to say that. Because now it's just like when you get momentum to go like that, they're going to go harder. More than what they've been doing. And that's the problem. That's where a lot of it, you know, that that's that double edged sword. Yes, it we is. want more protection. Yes, we want the police to do more. Um, but to say to ramp up racial profiling, that's also going to include innocent people, you know, and, and what we don't need is any more violence between the police and regular people who have nothing to do with the crime. You know, but I understand the frustration because, again, you know, Phipps Plaza, Lenox Mall, these are like, this is Buckhead. These are high-end areas. Mm -hmm. um, me and my yeah. youngest son, when we were in Atlanta in 2019 for Luda Day, that's where we stayed. You know, we stayed right across the street from Lenox Mall, had a nice little Airbnb condo. You know, that is a very nice area. And at this point, the shootings, the robbings, the carjackings that are going on around Lenox is just ridiculous. That's stuff that, you know, that most people are comfortable with it being at the swap meet, you know, or being somewhere in like Decatur, you know, not in Buckhead, you know. And that's why I say the, the violence is just out of control and it, it's such a double edged sword because. Why you have a segment of the population, yes, they want the police to do more. You still have another segment that's like, no, we just want to do community policing. You know, so it's like we can't have our cake and eat it, too. There has to be some type of solution, and hopefully something will come of this. Because th that's a shame that a child cannot ride in the back seat of a car with their mother and their aunt without a, a shootout ensuing and her getting shot in the head. She did nothing wrong, you know, and, and it's stories like that everywhere. Everywhere. Well, what I wanted to add is like we sh policing, while it does have its place, um, we need to get back to repairing our communities because mm. like you see uh, fragmented families, fragmented homes, fragmented individuals. Like, again, that's where you start building wealth when you actually take care of a home and then you have a community where you guys can protect each other and police your own areas because you got people from different areas coming into your neighborhood and the tensions run high, their first thing is fight or flight. And most of those times we've seen those results that, you know, were fatal to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And then we have standards and codes of conduct to where we go back to that time where, you know, the children, you know, weren't harmed or in, out of harm's way. And we yeah, take care of business codes. right now. Yeah, they were codes yeah. to the streets. And yeah. at this point, there's no code. You know, yeah, and I, I think what you yeah. made is a good point that 
it's so easy for us to depend and say, hey, the police need to do more. Hey, the lawmakers need to do more. But, yeah. hey, it starts with the family. The it family does. is the first teacher of the child. And some well, of these kids, you know what I'm saying, they're coming from broken homes. They're coming from parents who are so busy trying to be, you know, their friend, and they're not really parenting or they just don't care or, you know, maybe it's not even that deep. Maybe it's a parent that just they have to work. They don't have any extra help. They don't have any extra money. So there's only so much I can do to control my 15, 16 year old child. But that's why it starts from the time that they're young. Yeah. And you, you need to put some of the onus on artists like Jermaine Dupri because music is still influential. So instead of defunding the police, as some would say, won't you disfund the dysfunction that many mm. profit off of? Let's talk about it. Not saying that he's promoted any violence per se. I don't think he made any violent music. He's made more fun, sexual, you know, club music, stuff like that. But there are mm -hmm. certainly rappers who that is what they push out there. That is what they talk about. Matter of fact, Little Dirk is catching a bunch of backlash recently because he just dropped his latest album. And in that album, now, mind you, Little Dirk um, was really close friends with King Von. They were like mm -hmm. brothers. King Von was killed in Atlanta. Right. That huge yeah. situation that went down. And in Dirk's new album, he's dissing FBG Duck. Yeah. Why? And, you know, FB's mom is upset and, you know, a lot of fans are calling Dirk out. It's like y'all continue to perpetuate the nonsense. I just seen it on live. I guess Dirk finally went live and came up out of his, um, his shell, his cocoon. And, and you come out and dissing Duck. Folk. You got some other niggas that just smoked your homie. And you wanna diss duck? <laughs> duck ain't really did no more. Duck ain't even really your op no more, bro. At this point. He wanna get high as fuck. He about to get high like duck. Oh. Dirk! Dirk hurt cause V-Roy gone. He heard, he heard V-Roy Well, he better take that shit who made the, uh, uh, V-Roy gone. Not my motherfucking son. Cause he ain't doing. Remember they had a song together. Remember they had state differences. Motherfucker study one for the industry. This is proof. Y'all really showing, y'all, y'all rich out mixing it, my motherfucking son. Y'all rich out mixing it, Tuka. Show your crap. Do something else besides this and music. Show motherfuckers that you really, cause go pop like my son was trying to do. He was trying to cross over. And we know nine times out of ten, Lil Durk is a superstar now, so he's not going to be on O Block, you know, uh, shooting back and forth and, and, you know, trying to get revenge for King Von. But yeah. the powers in the music is going to be those little young boys in Chicago who are listening to that, who are now going to go down to 63rd on some revenge shit for Dirk. You know, yeah. and it's it's like we, we had to take responsibility. And I, I've never agreed with people sending children off like children are the youth and you should want the best for children. I don't care if it's my child, your child or the next person's child. Mm -hmm. You should want yeah. the best for them. And I'm not saying that we have to act like the world is, you know, peaches and cream and nothing bad ever happens. But I also feel like, you know, why are we so quick to perpetuate the evil? The negativity, yeah. the low vibrational stuff. And it's not just these artists. Like I've always said, I don't just blame the artists because I understand they're trying to make it. They're trying to eat. It also goes up the chain to the record companies and the record labels yeah. and how yeah. they're they're now going to the streets to sign real gangsters as opposed to people, you know, who are rapping about positive stuff. So until yeah. we are ready for a change, it's not going to happen. You know, and, and this is like I always say, like, you know, we all live in like one big circle of life and we mm. all have to be willing to put in that change. It can't just be we're going to put everything on the police. Or we're going to put everything on the mayor. We're going to put everything on the governor. It also starts in the home. It also starts with the entertainers. It also starts with social media. Like everybody plays a part in all of this yeah. mess that we see manifesting. Baby, let's go. Hey, tea sippers to listen to the rest of this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts. Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Tuned In, or AnchorFM.com, which is a free podcasting site. Thank you guys so much for the support, and stay tuned for the next video.